guys. Good evening and welcome to the TIFF Bell Light Box. My name is Lydia Oguang and I am a member of uh, the programming team at TIFF Cinematheque. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to tonight's screening of Douglas Gordon and Philippe Perino's Zidane, a 21st century portrait, an experimental documentary on the Algerian soccer star Zinedine Zidane. And we have a very special guest in attendance with us, programmer, film critic, and Zidane superfan Kiva Reardon. Woo! To begin, we would like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron Wendat. And we are very grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community. On behalf of TIFF, I would like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, and our public supporters, Ontario Creates, and Canada Council for the Arts. As a charitable organization, we would also like to thank our donors and members for making TIFF's year-round programming, educational, and community outreach initiatives possible. Um, so the screening is part of a series on acclaimed cinematographer Darius Kanji, who shot many films um, like David Fincher Seven and Michael Haneke's Amour. Um, and he's someone who's really helped define the visual aesthetics of contemporary international cinema. Um, we have someone who is going to speak to uh, his experimental soccer documentary tonight, very special guest, Kiva Reardon. Uh, Kiva is no stranger to many of you. She is a programmer at the Toronto International Film Festival and the Miami Film Festival, and the founding editor of Cleo, a journal of film and feminism. I do wanna note that Cleo's new issue dropped today, so please go to cleojournal.com and check it out. Uh, Kiva also curates the Redux section at the Hot Docs Canadian International Documentary Festival. And her Writing has been published in Filmmaker, The Globe and Mail, National Post, and Hazlitt. Previously, she has worked at the Doha Film Institute in Qatar, and she holds a master's degree in cinema studies from the University of Toronto. Please welcome to the stage, Kiva Reardon. This is the highlight of my year. I'm not even exaggerating. I made a slideshow. <clears throat> um, I'd like to start by thanking Brad Dean and Cameron Bailey for responding to my tweets where I just berated them to invite me to do this. Um, I have no expertise in Darius's filmmaking. However, I really like Zinedine Zidane, uh, so apparently this will make me qualified to talk to you about him and apparently also modern portraiture, which is what I decided would happen. Um, so to begin, I think we should take a look at what Emily Armstrong, a uh, top-rated Rotten Tomatoes super reviewer, had to say about uh, Zidane, a 21st century portrait. Oh my god, I hate this movie so much. It fails on every possible level. It's not an engaging portrait of a soccer player. It's not the chronicle of a fascinating sport. It's not even a good cover of a soccer game. This is a footage of a guy, a guy running around or when he's not shouting or when he's not milling around from 17 angles no less why is this called a 21st century portrait I'll never know I'm not saying this to mock Emily because in fact she's getting at uh, a real fundamental question about this film why is a film comprised of shots from a regular La Liga uh, match between Real Madrid and Villarreal from April 2005, uh, considered to be such an iconic take on a bald man kicking a ball. Well, to figure out this riddle and answer Emily's question, we need to understand three things. One, how this film was made, figure out exactly what portraiture is, and then also, luckily, talk about Sedan. So... The film is the easiest point to begin with. Uh, so we'll start with uh, New York Times critic Manola Dargis. In her review of the film, she said, and I think it sums it up quite nicely, no spoilers, I still won't even tell you who wins the match. Uh, the project was directed, conceived seems the better word, given the process and results, by Scottish-born artist Douglas Gordon and Algerius-born artist Philippe Perrineau. Uh, inspired by Zidane and issues of modern portraiture, the two use a large crew and 17 synchronized film and video cameras to track him during an April 2004 Five match at Madrid Stadium between two Spanish teams, Villarreal and Real Madrid. Okay, so the key thing to note here is the 17 cameras, I'll keep coming back to this, um, which could seem like a mere gimmick or maybe uh, you know commentary on the surveillance state, but when we think about portraiture, uh, they take on a different meaning. 
Uh, so what are the issues, as was alluded to in Dargis's review, around modern portraiture? Now, sadly, friends, I dropped out of the one art history class I ever enrolled in because I understood literally nothing. So to do this talk, I went to a very reliable source, the Museum of Modern Arts, to see what they defined as portraits. So portraits can be literal, realistic representations, or they can be interpretive and symbolic. Uh, by the turn of the 20th century, photography had become the most accessible and popular medium for portraiture, as, uh, as though photography freed them from the burden of producing realistic depictions. Uh, many late 19th and early 20th century artists began exploring new ways to represent people. Thank you, Momo. That is truly great stuff, and I'm still glad I dropped that class. So in this neat summation of truly hundreds and hundreds of years of art, there are a few key points that I hope to take away in the next 10 to 15 minutes uh, that speak to what this film is trying to tackle. It was a football pun. I don't see many football kits out there but I like my one supportive friend who was going for it. So thank you so much. Uh, so what they're trying to tackle, um, particularly the late 19th century and 20th century artists beginning to explore new ways to represent people and the question of realism around the rise of photography. Now, you can't talk about photography and not talk about Susan Sontag. This is literally gonna be a cue for, see, she just said, oh my God, my friend to laugh at me. Um, so I'm gonna quote some Sontag for you. Um, here we have uh, from 1977's On Photography where she said, uh, needing to have reality confirmed and experience enhanced by photographs is an aesthetic consumerism to which everyone is now addicted. Uh, this was well before iPhones. Sontag really uh, had our number when it came to seeking some fundamental knowledge or the theory that we could find some fundamental knowledge about ourselves and others through photography and um, portraiture and representation. And she also notes that while we, uh, she also takes, and the latter point is something that I think we completely take for granted now, given the abundance of photography, uh, to be able to see oneself and one's parents and ch as children is an experience unique to our time. The camera has brought, new, has brought people a new and essentially pathetic relation to themselves, and I, pathetic not in a sad way, but in a sense of pathos, uh, to their physical appearance, to aging, and to their own mortality. It's a kind of pathos which never existed before. So I bring this up because I like Susan Sondag, but also because when we consider the weight of documenting and capturing another person, it begs the question, what is the aim? Um, what is the essence that we want to evoke? So in a classical sense, or as MoMA said, you know, the literal realistic representation, this meant capturing the face um, and exactly what the eye, the human eye could see. Um, and when you think about it in a time when images weren't readily circulated, just getting a face right still really meant a lot, and even in this day and age, it still does. You can think of the Kate Middleton terrible portraiture, or more recently, <laughs> Mo Salah's terrible statue. Uh, this is the only Liverpool dig I will make tonight, but this was a great meme after they lost to uh, Red Star, which is a beautiful day. We get it, you're at the top of the Premier League, nobody cares, you never walk alone, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever, they're a team. Um, okay, but getting back to the aim of portraiture, so if we're living in a reality where everything needs to be, and I quote again, confirmed and experience enhanced by photographs, and I would also add then either film or enhanced through film, um, how, does this, how does the film medium then push back against this tyranny of the real and realism? So, you know, just as art moved from this attempt at realism to expressionism, cubism, uh, modernism, film also went on a similar journey aesthetically. Um, at first, it was an amazing technology that could capture movement. Think of the train arriving at the station and people jumping out of their seats because they thought the train would come through the screen. Um, but then it also was this realization that capturing movement meant that we could examine more than what the eye could actually see. And this was something that the 1930s French surrealists like uh, Jean Pinlevé were completely obsessed with. Um, the idea that you could explode reality by exploding the image that your eye took in. Um, the zoom was something they really liked, for instance, because that's not something that the human eye can actually do. Um, so when we think of the 17 camera setup in this context, I would argue it's a logical extension of this kind of experiment or aesthetic movement and that, Emily, wherever you are today, is uh, very specific to the 21st century. Huh? Okay, see where I'm going with this? Great. So this brings us finally to sit down. <sighs> Guys, this is truly the best day of my life. Okay, so in order to understand 
Does everyone know, everyone knows this incredible song by Ariana Grande, thank you, next. This was a riff on this meme. So anyway, we'll get into why, but. Uh, so in order to understand, again, what makes Zidane so uniquely situated to be specifically a 21st century portrait, we need some background. So Zinedine Zidane was born in 1972 in Marseille. He was the youngest of five children, uh, two parents who immigrated to France from the Kabyle region in Algeria just before the War of Independence in 1953. And this is truly important to note because he rose to become an icon of France. There will be a show and tell segment of this presentation, which will return to this, um, which is a country that is still deeply fractured, or we could just say downright racist, um, when it comes to its relationship with citizens who uh, have roots in countries it once occupies. Uh, Zidane said himself in an interview with The Guardian in 2004, uh, a year before this film was shot, um, it was my father who taught me that as an immigrant, we must work twice as hard as anybody else. Uh, so Zidane started playing football in Ligue 1 at Cannes. Um, he experienced racism already then. He was quite young at the age of 17 or 18 um, from spectators and also teammates who made fun of where he, uh, where he grew up. He also there met his wife, Veronique, and they've been together forever and they have five very lovely sons. Follow them on Instagram, it's just delightful. Um, and uh, he, <laughs> he then went on to play for Bordeaux. Then he moved to Series A in Italy to join Juventus, boo. He played there from 1996 to 2001. Then he went to La Liga in Spain and he played with Real Madrid, yay. And he played there from 2001 to 2006. There is no bias in this presentation. It's incredible, I know. I know you're all very, very appreciative of that. Um, this is the very key part though in terms of this presentation. He also played for the French national team from 1994 to, to, to 2006. Uh, and he represented Les Bleus at the FIFA World Cups in 1998 where they won, that's the first pick. Oh wait, I just learned I could do this. Oh, that's the first picture there. And then, uh, and we're going to return to this as well. He then retired in 2006. This is shortly after this moment. Um, and uh, I will turn to that as well, uh, where he started toying with the idea of uh, starting to have a managerial career. And he started with this in 2010. France did so badly that year in South Africa at the World Cup that he expressed no interest in coaching. Uh, this is a minor segue, but um, being of an Irish background, I'm now morally and legally required to note that at the 2000, uh, 2010 World Cup, uh, France actually eliminated Ireland um, on a handball by Thierry Henry. Uh, and because FIFA is a corrupt and awful institution, no one ever challenged this, and so they did not proceed on. And so uh, here's a photo of Damien Duff and Robbie Keane having a pint on a doorstep somewhere in Dublin. And I hope one day we all express the kind of joy as Duffer and Kino experience there. And uh, all right, let's get back to Zidane then. Uh, okay, great. So luckily for Real Madrid fans, in 2014, he changed his mind on managing and he started coaching Real's B team and then took over for Real Madrid in 2016 and he went on to lead them to win three back-to-back -back UEFA, uh, UEFA Cup championships, which is a truly tremendous feat. Then suddenly, days after we crushed Liverpool, <laughs> there was one more Liverpool dig, uh, he retired. And that is this image, and I spent the day in bed crying. Um, so if I can direct your attention back to this incredible work on this slide here. Uh, we have three key moments in Zidane's life, as defined by me. <laughs> Just roll with me on this one, guys. Uh, which explain, uh, explain uh, the first one, sorry, uh, explains sort of why he, or they all explain why he was ripe for this idea of a 21st century portraiture. Um, the first image, which taught me love, is uh, after winning the 1998 World Cup. And after this win, uh, his image was actually projected on the Arc de Triomphe. Um, and much like when France won the World Cup again this year, suddenly no one uh, in France cared about immigration. Suddenly, um, yeah, racism had been cured, which was interesting, and we'll return to this point. Um, the second apology, or the second image, his uh, apology after his uh, infamous headbutt at the 2006 World Cup against Italy. Uh, this was also this was uh, off, uh, happened after this uh, the film had been um, this film had been made. Um, but it's important to know just because it did um, really catapult him to fame across the pond as well. Um, in France, everyone from L'Equipe to Jacques Chirac was weighing in on this and the, you know, the morality of the situation. Um, but 
even before, even before all this, Zan was truly an icon in France, more broadly in Europe and also in uh, North Africa. Sorry, it's kind of grainy is the best image I could find, but I've actually seen these in people's apartments when I lived in Paris. Um, so in the context of Europe, particularly France, uh, Zidane represented a new kind, one might say, Emily, a 21st century kind of icon, uh, because he was one of dual identity. Um, as Camille Jackson wrote in Duke Today, uh, there is no hyphens when it comes to describing the French. All people in France, France are simply French. As a French citizen, your allegiance to France trumps all other aspects of your identity. So this is really important to uh, keep in mind in terms of Zidane because again, he was coming from a Kibbeel background, uh, or his parents. Um, but then also bear in mind that in 2002, there were, the elections in France saw Jacques, Jacques Chirac against uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, the uh, far-right anti-immigration dirtbag, and in 2005, the year that this film was um, this film was made, there was uprisings in the banlieues of Paris um, around a lack of employment and systemic racism that were at the root of this. Um, so this question of, uh, of dual citizenship, of dual identity, um, has been growing and is still a very, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, sort of contentious topic in French society. Um, but Zidane's hyper-visibility -vis challenged, but, and I really can't underline this enough, it did not fix this, uh, but he did challenge this idea. Um, as he said in Esquire, um, I have an affinity with the Arabic world. I have it in my blood via my parents. I'm very proud of being French, but also very proud of having these roots and this diversity. Um, and there's an image of him being projected on the Arc de Triomphe. Um, oh, I actually made a slide about this, but unfortunately I have a really bad computer and it crashed. Uh, but just to sort of illustrate this point of, um, of dual identity again, uh, here are two magazines from this year. One is L'Histoire, and it's a history of the Berbers, and it's um, from St. Augustine to Zinedine Zidane. So pretty good company to be in. And then later in the same year, Zidane, in héros français. So again, you have this question uh, that is, again, as I said, a very contentious um, topic within France and what it means to be, say, French Algerian or French hyphen anything. So one very crucial point that we haven't discussed yet is also he was an icon for being literally amazing at playing football. Um, in the history of human exi existence, let alone photography or film, sports stars, as we know them today, are relatively new inventions. Um, you might say 20th or 21st century ones here. Emily, somewhere, wherever you are. Um, so images of these stars are now trafficked across the world as part of hyper-capitalism, selling us everything from shoes to dandruff shampoo. And while historically we've always revered moving bodies excelling in physical excellence, be that from the gladiators to UFC in uh, contemporary times, we're now, as Sontag noted, at a, at a stage of sort of hyper representation and technology so that we can capture the moving body like never before. So to start to summarize everything here, why is this a 21st century portrait? Um, one, the film's form. So this, again, uh, challenges a conventional idea of what video or photography-based portraiture can do, whereas before we had something like Moybridge's horse. Uh, in a 21st century, there's 17 cameras, uh, some of which are even shown in the film, so we have this double sense of capturing the capturing. And it's trained on one man, and he, again, is also being filmed from all these different angles. One quick side note here, uh, to pull again from Manola Dargis's review, it's worth noting that the male filmmakers avoid the athlete's groin and rear, which suggests that while Sedan is an object of desire, including as an athlete and celebrity, this desire has been carefully, carefully circumcised, uh, circumcised. I'm not saying that correctly. In any case, the point here is to remember that portraits are always created by someone doing the looking, and all looking is political. Um, to return again to why this is a portrait, however, uh, and these 17 cameras, uh, this focus, or rather lack thereof, explodes Zidane's image, his movements, and, this way, uh, and in this way, an easy representation of what he was. So while you know, Sontag lamented that photography could be too binary, sort of between a past and a present, and a longing for what was and to be where you are now, the mixed angles, the types of images, it will cut from film to TV broadcast, the sound levels change, it's kind of all over the place in the film. They don't offer any one idea of Zidane as a person or kind of even as a player. And instead, he's, he's actually sort of a composite of all these different angles. 
And then the second point of why it's a 21st century portrait is who Zidane himself is. Uh, I mean, one way to think about this is that during this match, David Beckham is also on the field at the same time, but we're not training the camera on him. Um, and I think that's because Zidane uh, was not only a better football player, <laughs> hot take, um, but also what he represented um, to France and beyond in terms of this question of a dual identity um, and embodying the presence of a colonial past while also turning out to be the biggest hero that France has ever embodied. So in summation, Emily, that is why we're now about to watch a 21st century portrait. Thank you so much for bearing with me. 